Hey everyone, so recently I was actually a moderator at the Inside Quantum Technology Conference where I was moderating a panel on quantum computing and cryptocurrencies. Now, I've talked a lot about the safety of Bitcoin, attacks that quantum computers can have on different cryptocurrencies, and quantum safe encryption. And so I was really honored to actually be a part of this panel and discuss this with some amazing researchers. So here, I wanted to recap a little bit about what we talked about on the panel and things I agree or I disagree with. Remember, these are just my opinions and this is a little different than the purely fact-based videos that I do, but hey, this is a future technology, so there's a little bit of dreaming and a little bit of opinions there, but I hope you'll share some of your opinions below as well. Now first, let's summarize what the actual problem is with cryptocurrencies. The big thing that we're concerned about is that the public key is exposed whenever you make a transaction. This is currently just fine. There's no reason the public key can't be exposed. That's how public key encryption works because deriving the private key from that public key would take millions and perhaps billions of years, depending on the key size. The problem that comes into play is that if we have a big enough and coherent enough quantum computer, it could potentially take that public key and derive the private key from it and actually use that private key, that person can use it to make unauthorized transactions on your behalf. We did briefly talk about 51% attacks and actually reclaiming lost coins, lost private keys, which I covered a lot in my other video, so you can check it out here, but that wasn't the focus of this panel. So when should we worry about quantum computing actually affecting cryptocurrency? Well, that was kind of the big question I wanted the panel to answer. I have my own opinions, as you know, you've seen my other videos, that I think it's going to be at least a decade, if not more, and it seems like a lot of scientists agree with me on this. And honestly, I was surprised by their responses. Personally, knowing the state of the industry research and the academic research in quantum computing, I'm not that worried. You all have seen my cryptocurrency portfolio, and you know that I have my money and investment in non-quantum secure cryptocurrencies. Now, before I get any further, I actually want to tell you about this really cool job opportunity I heard about in my network actually relating to cryptocurrencies. And hey, even if you don't fit this job description, don't leave yet because they have a referral bonus and you can get $2,000 for just referring the right person for the job. So groupincome.org is actually looking for a JavaScript developer. So what do they do? Group income is decentralized voluntary basic income with people that you trust, your own community that supports each other to provide basic income and income insurance. So in my opinion, this is a really cool mission. They believe that gives the freedom to think, experiment, and really be able to have the freedom to pursue creativity or other big ideas. You know, I think of myself and my friends and we're all creators and it's pretty tough. Views go up, views go down. You never know what your month is going to be like. But what if all of us could actually take all that income and provide insurance for ourselves? So if one of us has a bad month, we don't have to be concerned about the algorithm or doing anything crazy or making clickbait videos. We can really focus on our mission and the content that we want to make. This allows you and your friends to support each other and figure out maybe what you're passionate about or if you want to start a company, support each other through this basic income. So for this job at Group Income, they're looking for experienced JavaScript developer with an interest in information security and an interest in decentralized tech and working for a nonprofit. And by the way, on top of all of this, if you don't feel you're ready yet, but you're interested in this mission, they actually have this GitHub full of features that you can build and get paid for it. That bounty means that you can get paid to contribute to the software and add this to your portfolio because it is open source. Another great thing is that they love self-taught people as well. So no caring about your GPA or whether you worked for a fancy fan company. They want to see your projects, your portfolio, and your passion for the tech. And by the way, you can get paid in cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Monero, or Zcash. They also have other job openings for a JavaScript developer familiar with a lightning network, a technical writer, and a fundraiser or a marketer with fundraising experience. So check those links out and go to their website and look at their YouTube channel because they have a lot of cool videos on the tech. So thanks Group Income for sponsoring this video and I have all the links to their website, to their videos and the jobs below in the description. So when should we worry about quantum computing actually affecting cryptocurrency? Well, that was kind of the big question I wanted the panel to answer. And yeah, honestly, I was surprised by the responses. So if you all have seen my other videos, I've talked about the commercial state and I'm very familiar with the commercial state of quantum computing. And because I know that and I have some insights into the academic research, I'm personally not that worried. I have my portfolio and I have non-quantum safe cryptocurrencies in it. However, these panelists said the time to worry is now. 
And in some ways I agree and in some ways I disagree. Now we have to distinguish between the commercial state and the real state of quantum computing. Of course, a lot of people ask me, well, what if a government already has a huge quantum computer and they're keeping silent and decrypting everything that we do? And it's true that it's possible. The government has been ahead in developing technologies before. So for example, the internet. The internet, a lot of the foundation of it was funded and created by DARPA, a government agency. ARPANET was the first wide area network, an intranet, and a lot of the technology set up the web as it is today. So yes, it's not impossible for the US government or another country to be further ahead than we think. And I do agree with the panelists here that if the US government or any other government has developed a large quantum computer, they have absolutely no incentive to tell us whether they have or not. The best thing to do is to silently spy on people. That's what I would do. So the panelists here seem to think that commercial quantum computing was actually behind government quantum computing and that the canary in the coal mine was already dead and we should be worried right now. Now, to me personally, it would be hard to imagine that the US government is that far ahead. That's what I think. NIST itself has not released post-quantum standards, which I believe the government would have to follow very, very quickly. And I do think that if the US government was very far ahead or we had intelligence that another government was very far ahead on breaking this encryption, that whole process would be speed up a lot, sped up a lot. <laughs> NIST would be accelerating their timelines to release the post-quantum encryption. And I think there'd be a lot of incentives we would see for actually moving to this post-quantum standard. I personally haven't seen a ton of evidence with that yet, but I'd love to hear from the cryptography and security folks whether you're seeing something different. Obviously, I go through a lot more of the physics journals and see what the state of the art is there, but maybe you have more intelligence from your cryptography journals. So make sure to comment down below if you have any insights or any papers that you've seen on this. If there were signs of that, I would expect to be some movement forward in non-approved post-quantum cryptography. And remember, there's still a difference between quantum cryptography and post-quantum cryptography. Post-quantum cryptography is still mathematical problems. They don't use any specialized equipment. They are mathematical problems that we're applying back and forth to encrypt and decrypt data. Quantum encryption, however, actually uses the physical laws of quantum mechanics to do the encryption. In that case, you're using quantum properties to create a shared key between two parties. And you can be sure, or sure, it's provably secure, that no one has spied on the creation of the key. And this is due to the fact that the quantum superposition will collapse if you measure it. And another point from Dr. Robert Campbell that I absolutely loved, anything can be hacked. And if you say that something can't be hacked, well, I think we'll be hacked even faster for people to prove you wrong. Even if quantum cryptography is provably secure, secure using these laws of quantum mechanics, that does not mean that there are no attacks whatsoever. The endpoints could be less secure, the layers on top of it, or you can just be tortured into giving up your key. These attacks don't attack the encryption itself, but they still get the end result that you want. I personally think due to the nature of what I do, again, the governments can't be that far ahead. Maybe I'm being a little naive. And I think the first thing they would attack is not cryptocurrency portfolios. Well, at least definitely not mine. They also flag the security of the exchanges and the custodians themselves. And this I totally agree with. You should do your own research and make sure that wherever you're storing your cryptocurrency is safe. Look into the security, understand the cryptocurrency technology, and see what the insurance is. You might actually be surprised how small the security teams are in some of these custodians. So towards the end, when we were wrapping up the panel, I also asked them that would they keep quantum insecure cryptocurrencies in their portfolio and how would they do it? And also had a range of answers here. Now remember, these are people that are very well connected to the security side, to the quantum side, and I think it's very interesting the different insights they had here. Now, what I got from this panel, and not explicitly, but from what we talked about in general, is that cryptocurrencies, NFTs, this is all here to stay. Digital currency is not going anywhere. However, they are skeptical that this is safe even now. Here on the quantum side, I slightly disagree. I don't think we're that far ahead. However, in general, cryptocurrency is kind of the wild west and there's a lot of security layers you have to think about. I don't think quantum computing is the biggest risk factor right now and I don't think they implied that at all, but there's so many security issues in some of these custodians. Anderson Chang in specific talked about how insecure these platforms can be and how you should be really careful here if you store your cryptocurrency in an exchange. And there's absolutely no insurance. So your bank, for example, has FDIC protection, meaning your money is protected up to a certain amount and crypto custodians generally don't have that. 
Now, I'm a big fan of holding my own cryptocurrencies and I made a mistake way back in the day where I bought Bitcoin and Ethereum using Robinhood. The problem is, is that you can buy the cryptocurrency, you can sell the cryptocurrency, but you can't transfer it. So is that truly ownership? Or there are these grayscale Ethereum and Bitcoin trusts, but you don't actually own the cryptocurrencies themselves here. Personally, I can't wait for Robinhood to release the Bitcoin and Ethereum wallets because I'm still salty about GME. But also, I want to actually own the Bitcoin and the Ethereum myself and be able to do whatever I want with it, buy, sell, or transfer. Now, I know that was a lot of doom and gloom, but what's a crypto custodian actually do? Now, even if we assume that the elliptic curve encryption is safe today, Shor's algorithm won't be in play for a decade or more, there's still the end-to-end -end security of all these systems to consider. One of the best things these crypto custodians can do is actually be ready for an upgrade. It takes a really long time to upgrade systems. So I read in the NIST reports that for some places, it takes up to 10 years to audit everything and make sure everything is upgraded. That means if NIST releases its recommendations in the next two to four years, and a large enough quantum computer is a decade away, well, that's not actually a lot of time to upgrade. So for a crypto custodian, having that plan in place, not only the ledger itself, but a plan on all points of a security to upgrade is necessary. And this goes for everyone, not just crypto custodians, but banks, anyone else. Evaluate and audit what third-party libraries you're using that may not be upgraded quickly enough. Make sure that all points of your app are secure and you have a plan to upgrade. That way, even if a big enough quantum computer is a decade away, or if we discover that some other country has a quantum computer and we need to upgrade quickly, at least you already have a plan in place. And even if it's not a quantum computer, it could be another security breach. So having that audit log is a great idea. So it was really an amazing panel and the entire conference was amazing. And I know sometimes I'm very pessimistic about the future of quantum technology. So I do enjoy these conferences where we get to dream a little and think about all the impacts that quantum technology can have, positive and negative, in the future. There's that grind of the day-to-day -day and trying not to overhype it. It feels like there's only hype that, for me, this was a really refreshing step back and getting to moderate the panel with these experts was really amazing. Of course, being cautious of the hype is really, really important and there's a lot of hype going on right now. And there's always kind of unscrupulous people out there who, because quantum computing can sometimes be harder to explain, may try and lie or exaggerate certain parts of their technology. So a big part of my channel here that I'm trying to convey is to actually be very truthful and tell you exactly what we know, what we don't know, and try not to overhype because this technology is still pretty new in terms of the growth of the research, but quantum physics has been around for a very long time. There's not enough people that truly deeply understand quantum technology and not enough people to call others out on it when they are maybe stretching the truth about what quantum tech can do. And hopefully we can train more people to know more about quantum technology to become quantum natives and get really excited and dream up more use cases for the tech. So conferences like this are a great time to dream, but also level set on kind of where the technology is and what exploration paths everyone is going through. I had a great time on the panel. I just wish it lasted hours longer. So let me know if you have any other questions here. I have a bunch of other videos here on Bitcoin and quantum computing attacks, post-quantum and quantum cryptography, and quantum safe or quantum safe claimed cryptocurrencies.